dose reduction, you really uh, have to understand uh, these technologies to uh, be able to communicate with your staff uh, to accomplish the goal of limiting dose. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, uh, you can look at this book uh, that should be available, but I want to thank the uh, Oxford Press for some, allowing me to use some of the images from the book uh, for this talk. So going back in time, and this is actually pretty close to the start of my own career in 79, uh, 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 the Nobel Prize was given to uh, Godfrey Hounsfield and this was remarkable because it was just six years after he developed his patent for CT imaging. So a very short time uh, from its initiation. But uh, what was even uh, more remarkable, I think, was that uh, at the time the Nobel was awarded, there were already a thousand CT scanners on order. So this was uh, rapidly adopted by the medical community because it was really the first time uh, you could look effectively inside the body and the skull. This is actually a drawing from his uh, 1973 patent application. And this is how the early scans were acquired. Uh, so you have a, a source and a, and a receiver, and these were walked across the uh, object or patient in this fashion, and then the whole device was rotated. And his first device actually used a gamma ray source, not an x-ray tube. And it did use multiple detectors, uh, which eventually uh, was adopted by in all CT scanners. But this was conceived by him as a solution to this question about what's inside the box. Uh, a little history uh, which is of interest is that the company he worked for is the same company that had the rights to the Beatles songs, and presumably uh, was pretty flush with money that allowed him to investigate something so far afield from the music world. So the data on those early scans was acquired in a linear fashion and was then used a standard calculation that was uh, based on this principle of matrix that if you know the sums of all the rows, so if we know the sums of all of these rows, but we have empty boxes, we can back calculate those empty boxes. In this case, of course, three, if you look at the sums across here and the sums across here. So uh, this was this idea of matrix filling if you were aware of the values at the periphery. So what the early CT scanners did, and in a sense do even now, is to develop uh, a technique to measure these external values and back calculate inside. So these first CT scanners use this technique of uh, translate rotate. And so we had a, a detector and a source that would move around the patient uh, and eventually this became what was known as the third generation design. There was, there's an x-ray source with a fan beam and a curved set of detectors. Now this is what's used in all of the scanners now. The techniques for reconstruction of the data uh, actually go back to 1940, so obviously decades before the first CT scanners. And this was uh, based on this principle of back projection, which was a visual technique or a light technique uh, to acquire the information in a projection. And here you can see in sort of combining these different views using light, you can sort of approximate these, uh, this uh, device. But it was used in the, in the early CT scanners, not because it was preferential to an actual mathematical reconstruction, but because of the available computer power at that time. So in order to uh, uh, allow for reconstruction a reasonable time, algebraic reconstruction, which is that mathematical reconstruction I just mentioned, uh, was uh, uh, abandoned for this back projection technique because back projection is just simpler. What's now called iterative reconstruction, and those of you that interact with CT scanners have probably heard this term, uh, this uh, has been made possible now because of the low cost and availability of these advanced computers. Iterative reconstruction, which is the mathematical reconstruction of the data, uh, the problem with it is that, as opposed to that pure mathematical model I gave you, uh, we have to assume that the data that the CT scanner collects is inherently flawed. And there's a variety of reasons for this, beam hardening, uh, 
uh, metal, uh, yeah, and so on, and that th there are errors in the, in the calculations that are introduced from the acquisition of the data. So at best, the computer can only provide an approximation. So this is why you'll see uh, on some of your scanners, it'll allow you to set the number of iterations or the amount of time basically the computer works on the problems because it is in a sense an insolvable problem because of the errors in the data. So this is kind of a rudimentary drawing of how back projection works is we have an x-ray uh, source uh, and, and detector. And so we get these values that we collect. So again, if we have a phantom where we have something of relatively high attenuation here and lower attenuation out here, these are the values that we determine. This is what the projection looks like. So if we work with the projection data, this is how the a reconstruction of projection data looks as you overlay the different views. And again, we get this rough approximation of this object by using projection. Uh, and so these early CT scanners were limited to a single slice. Now, now we use what's called helical or spiral scanning. The way this is done is rather than to uh, a so-called step and shoot where we turn the, you know, the device on, we scan one slice, move on to the next slice. Now this tube is just left on and the table is moved through the scanner at a constant speed. But this was not really a hardware breakthrough. This was a mathematical breakthrough. So again, here's a representation of the path of the x-ray beam through the patient and creates this spiral or sometimes called helical. So, <clears throat> what was the mathematical breakthrough? Well, if you think about it, the data that's collected is obliquely acquired through the patient. But we want to see slices that are orthogonal or perpendicular to the patient. So this requires interpolating the data that acquired these angled uh, complex uh, um, uh, collections into a flat plane. So this requires a interpolation. Now the way, the way to, I think about interpolation, uh, if any of you have ever sold a house or a condominium, is that the way they determine a, the value of a house, at least in the US, is they, a, they look at houses nearby who sold recently uh, before you put your house on sale. So they don't actually go through the house and say, oh, this house has like a very nice kitchen and this house has granite counters and this house has three bathrooms. They basically kind of add up the number of bedrooms, the square footage, and they kind of look around the neighborhood. Now, if the next house is like 10 miles away and only one house has been sold in the last five years, then that there's going to be a lot of uh, error in terms of calculating the value of the house. As opposed to, let's say you own a, in a, a condominium in a, in a building where all the condominiums are exactly the same, then, then pretty much the value of the condominium is set by what was sold in any recent period of time because they're all roughly the same. So this is the way I think about interpolation is this idea that the closer the slices are, so this is basically a scan performed with a large pitch or a high pitch. So there's a lot of space between the actual data that's acquired. So if this slice determines that this uh, attenuation value is zero, and this slice has an attenuation of 10, then the scanner will sort of guess in the calculation that maybe this is two, maybe this is five, maybe this is seven. It's really just an approximation of these values in between the acquired slices. Whereas if the slices are closer together, then we get, we get a better uh, approximation of the values and you can determine uh, a basically smaller spaces between the data points. So the pathway that the scanner takes in a single slice scanner or single uh, detector scanner done helically is like this. Now we can set the detectors as relatively wide. We get this wide ribbon. Or we have this scan, again, single detector, but of high pitch, so we have gaps in between the bands. Or we can do what's called multi-detector scanner, where we, have, we go through the same path, but now we have multiple detectors uh, and allows for a wider beam, uh, but more data that is acquired closer together. So when I say that the big, big breakthrough was really mathematical, the early helical scanners really were just standard scanners that were just run by, uh, by uh, push, putting the table through the scanner while the tube was let off, left, left on. 
The problem with those early scanners was tube heating. The tubes were not really designed to be left on. And I can remember in trauma cases, in the middle of a trauma case, having to stop uh, scanning to allow the tube to call, cool off. So if you're doing like a chest, abdomen, pelvis in a, in a major trauma, you might have to quit in the middle of the abdomen and start again after, uh, after waiting for the tube to cool down. It was a stressful situation. And the other thing was that the wires were actually, they were actually hard wires that connected the power and the data to the scanner. And so the way the scanners were run is that they would have long wires and they would wind the wires up in one direction. And then when they would scan again, they would unwind the wires. The, the multiple detectors were introduced initially as a workaround for the tube heating. The idea being that if you could acquire the data in, in less time, that you might be able to get through a large area of the patient without having to worry about the tube overheating. And then uh, slip rings were introduced to solve the wire wrapping problem. Now, uh, slip ring is basically shown here. I remember visiting my, uh, my uh, in-laws uh, and they live in rural Vermont. And in the days of antennas, the way they would uh, get some channels is they would rotate the antenna on the roof to try to maximize the uh, reception. And in, in order to avoid the problem of wire wrapping, there would be contacts in between uh, uh, these two separate isolated rings so, the, so you could get uh, basically sort of positive and negative or signal uh, information from this connection, but the antenna could be rotated indefinitely without worrying about wire wrapping. And this is the way that uh, tank tur turrets work as well. So this is what the slip ring looks like on a modern CT scanner. So there are multiple rings and the contacts are in this panel. So you can rotate the tube indefinitely without worrying about wire wrapping. And remember, there's a lot of voltage going through these uh, contacts. So this is a pretty sophisticated electrical and mechanical design. Now, the, in order to house the detectors, they're, they're encased here. This is an early CT scanner that had uh, 16 rows, which is considered quite uh, narrow by modern standards. But these were housed in, uh, in a, this, you can see this curved detector array that would rotate perpendicular to the X-ray tube. Now, each one of these rows has, say, over 750 individual detectors. So we're not talking about 16 detectors. We're talking about 16 detector rows with each row with over like 750 or so de individual detectors in it. Now, this was a, a scanner that was offered, I think, by Toshiba that had 320 detector rows. And you can see the width of it relative to this pen. This was wide enough that you could scan the entire head with one rotation. So in a sense, uh, we, we kind of worked helical imaging so far with multi-detector row that you could actually go back to axial imaging and cover the entire uh, volume in a single rotation. This always reminded me of a story about a friend of mine that had, uh, had a pretty large property and every number of years he would trade in his mower for a wider mower. And uh, he would say that eventually he wanted to get a mower that was wide enough that he could cut the entire lawn by going once down and once back. So that's the way that uh, helical detectors have gone is they've gone to become wider and wider uh, sets of arrays to get more coverage for each rotation. Uh, but there's some disadvantages to this approach is that it, a metal plate is used between each row to limit scatter. And this plate or the septation uh, adds weight to the array. And of course, now we have multiple arrays with multiple detectors. So it becomes quite an engineering problem to spin these large arrays uh, without any wobble or bearing failure. And also adds to the x-ray exposure because up to about 20% of the dose is lost in the septations and doesn't contribute to the final image. So uh, if you, uh, you may think that with modern scanners, we have substantially reduced dose, but in a sense, the opposite has occurred. And I'll try to explain that to you, uh, why dose actually is uh, somewhat higher on helical imaging than it is on step and shoot axial imaging. So we'll go through now some basic CT terms. Uh, now, again, I apologize. Some of you are very familiar with this, but I just want to uh, put everyone on, uh, on sort of a good footing so that we can get into some more advanced uh, uh, topics. So 
pixel size can be expressed in a sense by the matrix value. So if you know the field of view and what the matrix is, now the matrix is usually expressed in this way, you know, 512 by 512, here's 1024 by 1024. Now on CT scanner, almost these two values are almost always the same. On MR, they can differ because we generally pick in the phase direction a lower number of uh, 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 units, but in any event, the, the, the resolution or the, uh, the fineness of the matrix does not necessarily correlate with detection. So here's just an example. This has a much lower matrix, so in a sense, larger pixels, but there's inherently more contrast in an MR image than a CT image. So while on the CT image, which has very high resolution, I can vaguely see this area of low attenuation that goes along with this uh, infarct, on MR, it's much more visible because we have higher contrast. So matrix is just one factor that determines conspicuity. That's even more extreme. Here's a 1024 CT image and uh, diffusion imaging uses a very coarse matrix in order to have rapid uh, CT or MR acquisition. So, but this infarct in the ponds is much better seen on this low resolution image than this high resolution CT image. So again, this is just one of the factors you want to con con uh, consider. So again, uh, pixel is the size of the face on most uh, CT scanners. The size of the pixel face or the, pixel, the picture unit is a millimeter or less. The problem with uh, reconstructions for early CT scanners is that even though they had relatively small pixel size or picture elements, so again, each one of these little boxes is a picture element, but the, is, the slice is thick. So a lot of the early scanners had, a, say, a five millimeter to one centimeter uh, uh, width. The voxels were not uh, uh, shaped in a way that allowed for reconstruction. So the modern scanners, what they allow is that the data comes closer to a cubic or isotropic voxel. Let me I'll just show you what that means. These are anisotropic voxels, meaning that the slice thickness is much greater than the pixel face. So when you look at a CT scan, you're looking at this side, or if you think about them like shoe boxes, right? We're looking at the ends of the shoe boxes where maybe the size and the model of the shoe is demonstrated. But, but there's much more um, volume within the voxel that goes deeply into the slice thickness. So again, the more the slice thickness, the larger the voxel and the more opportunity for what's called volume averaging within the voxel since the, the value expressed on the pixel face is the average of all the things contained within the voxel. So this is the sort of reconstructions you get from these shoebox uh, shaped voxels. This is called stair stepping and this is what sagittal reconstructions look like on early CT scanners because the slice thickness, this would be the slice thickness, we can't, we can't resolve anything finer than the size of the voxels that are acquired by the scanner. What we've achieved with these modern scanners with very narrow detector rows is that the size of the voxels is pretty much the same on each side. So these are very close to cubes. So the picture face or the pixel is about a millimeter. And as, as long as the slice is around a millimeter, then the voxels are cubic. What this allows is that as far as we're concerned, whether we look at volume from this side, from this side, from this side, the image quality will all be about the same. And so this is a reconstruction. Here you can see a fracture through the dens. Uh, this is performed at 1.25. Uh, this is a, a 0.625 slice. Now we can see that this probably is not a fracture. This is probably a normal lucency you see about the growth center at the base of the dens. So uh, the noise is higher. You know, you can see this modeled look to the image. Uh, so we have a little more noise, but we have crisper edges because there's less volume averaging and the voxel size is smaller, basically close to cubic size once we get down to a millimeter or less. This is one of the benefits we have in reconstructions now with helical data. And I would urge you when you're reviewing scans, whenever you have a question, uh, ask the technologist to reconstruct the images at close to the detector thickness, and you should be acquiring your data at thin sections.
we'll talk a little bit about more about that acquisition. Now, another term that's used is pitch. Pitch is the path that the x-ray beam takes through the patient. Now, this is a little more complicated now because some manufacturers talk about detector pitch, but we're only going to refer to the beam pitch. The beam pitch is the distance the table travels per tube rotation. For example, a helical scan with no gaps is a pitch of one. Now, if you go below one, now you're looking at the, some of the uh, volume that you scan more than once. So this is, uh, comes back to in MR image, we talk about number of acquisitions. So in a sense, if you measure the same thing uh, several times, that you can uh, establish a value that is more accurate because you have less error. Excuse me one second, my dog. Hey, Lou, come here. Louie, come on, come on, come on. You sit with me. Here, this is my, if Bill Belichick can do it, I can do it. Here we go, all right. So any value uh, less than one is gonna provide a higher dose to the patient, but is gonna require uh, more scan time for the same coverage, but you'll have less noise in the image. So these are the compromises you make when you're designing the imaging protocols. It is your goal to have lowest possible uh, uh, scan time, then you're gonna go to a higher pitch. If you wanna decrease, you can go to a lower pitch. But if you want to decrease noise, you have to go to a lower pitch. So, uh, so again, these are all compromises that you make when you decide pitch. So again, why not use the standard pitch of say two? Because we automatically cut radiation dose in half. The problem is that again, like that example of the real estate, is that if the distance between the houses are large and the houses are a little different, uh, it's going to be, you're really just estimating what the value of a house is. In the same way, if there's a lot of space in between the data points that you acquire, uh, that there's going to be more errors that are introduced in the measured data. And you can never really reconstruct at a, a thin section if you have a high pitch. Now, another term that will come up is collimation. This refers to the constraint of the x-ray beam. So there's x-ray beam collimation. So in the early scanners, the beam collimation was the same as the slight thickness. So even if the detector was one centimeter in width, if, this, if the x-ray beam was only five millimeters in thickness, then your slice thickness is five millimeters. It was based on the uh, beam width. It's different from multi-detector scanners because even though in theory you can set the beam collimation uh, differently than the detector collimation, the beam collimation has to always be greater than the detector collimation. So again, if this is my uh, detector array, I have to cover all of the detectors in equal amount. And so usually the beam collimation is always slightly wider than the uh, detector rows. Now what I'm trying to illustrate in this image though is that if, even if you know the number of detectors on a scanner, you really don't know everything you need to know. Because if I were to say this scanner has, uh, uh, you know, many more rows than this one, but there may only be a few narrow detectors in the center. So not all scanners use the same width of the detectors. Early on, they tend to use, uh, have more thin sections in the center and larger ones on the outside. So depending on whether the scanner was designed to be a body type scanner where you might use larger uh, uh, slice thickness or a neuro scanner where you might do for say temporal bone studies, very narrow detectors. Although I think most of the manufacturers have moved now to a lot of thin sections because the body imagers are now reconstructing the data as well. But you have to know how your detectors are designed because you can't assume that a scanner with more detectors has more thin rows. So this is what I mean by tube collimation. It's the, it's the width of the beam that emerges from the x-ray tube. Now in detector collimation, you can decide whether you want to acquire the data as, for example, in this case, I wanted my detectors, my narrowest detector row is 1.25 millimeters. But I can combine these into a five, in theory, a five millimeter detector or I can acquire it as 1.5 and then make this merging happen in the reconstruction. 
My suggestion is to acquire always at the narrowest detector collimation, and you have then the option to reconstruct at narrow or thin sections. But if you acquire at five millimeter uh, by merging these together, you don't have the option to go back for thinner section. So this brings us to this concept of dose efficiency. So dose efficiency is a calculated value that reflects the absorption efficiency of the detectors and the geometric efficiency. So what's geometric efficiency? In a sense, how much of the beam is used to create the image? Now, multi-detector scanners has two problems. One is called overbeaming and one's overranging. And these uh, cause this multi-detector scanners to have a lower efficiency. So what is overranging? If this is the region of interest, if I want to cover that in axial mode, I cover exactly that volume in my uh, trajectory of the beam. But if I'm going to go in helical mode, because of interpolation, the beam always has to start outside of the image volume and end outside of the image volume. And depending on the scanner and the detector uh, uh, array width, uh, this may actually cover a lot of tissue that is outside of the region of interest. So again, this is, adds to the inefficiency of multi-detector scanner. And it's a term, at least you should be familiar with, it's called overranging. So again, coming back to this idea of dose efficiency, if I have a single detector row and my X-ray beam is collimated narrower than the X-ray uh, detector, then all of the X-rays are used to create the image. Whereas with a multi-detector array, there's always gonna be a little slop on the sides. This is wasted dose. This doesn't go, this doesn't contribute to patient imaging. Now again, on modern scanners, uh, this, these have been minimized, even overranging has been minimized. So we tend not to think about these in designing protocols, but I just want you to be aware of them and something to keep in mind. And, and I dissuade you from this idea of telling patients that you know, the dose is very low on these modern scanners because uh, the, in fact, the dose is not substantially lower than it was on the older single detector uh, scanners. So coming back to the detector collimation, my suggestion, and most people use this, is to scan thin and view thick. So when you acquire, let's say, you know, I, I do neuroimaging, when you acquire images of the brain, my suggestion is to use 0.75 or one millimeter detector collimation. But then when you wanna review the scan, you can review it in five millimeter slices, it gives you fewer slices to review, uh, it gives you a little better uh, contrast sometimes, certainly less uh, 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 noise in the image, but you have the option of going back to thinner sections if you want to reconstruct them in thinner slices. All right, we're still going through terminology, and I'm not sure we'll get through all of this today, but uh, again, I'm just trying to give you a foundation to understand CT imaging because Again, in, in, uh, certainly in the US with uh, pressure on uh, radiologists to read scans, I think we have less and less time and understanding of how these CT units work. And yet at the same time, we're responsible for limiting dose, which varies from site to site. KVP is a, is a term that's used for the peak electrical potential across the X-ray source. And the P stands for peak KV. This is not the average value. The beam doesn't have a single energy. The X-ray beam actually is composed of a number of different energies. They call it a polychromatic beam. And the actual mean energy of the beam is about 40% of the peak. So for, a, so for if the beam is set to be KVP of 120, the average value or the mean energy is about 50,000 uh, uh, electro, electron volts. The MA is the measure of the amperage or tube current. This can be expressed as MAS, which indicates both the current and duration, or MAS effective. That also incorporates the pitch. Now, I just want you to remind you about this. When you, so when you look at imaging protocols, there's, again, MA, MAS, and MAS effective. And, and this term is actually uh, one that can trip you up when you're setting uh, dose because the scanner, as you change one parameter, will often change another to try to achieve a similar signal and noise on the image. So just to go back uh, in, in terms of understanding electricity, one way to think about voltage and amperage is in terms of volume and pressure of water. I mean, for me, this is a little easier 
to understand. Voltage is the pressure of, say, water, while amperage is the volume of water. And so, uh, so again, which will move you more, water from a garden hose or a slow-moving ocean wave? So in the same way, a car battery that turns an engine over has a very low voltage, but a high amperage, right? Most cars use, in this country, 12-volt batteries, but has, you look for high amperage because we need that we need that force, the number of electrons to, uh, 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 to, to turn over the engine. Static electricity, you know, when you had a spark uh, in, on a dry winter day, that is extremely high voltage, but very low amperage. So if you think about water emerging from a water tank, you know, you see them on these towers in these small towns. Uh, if, we, if we draw the water from the bottom of the tank, or, or if you'll see sometimes on dams where they draw the water from, if you draw it from the bottom, the water's gonna come out with a uh, enormous amount of force, but it could be a very low volume. Whereas this tank, uh, if we draw water from the top and we have a very large hole, we're drawing a lot of water, but it had a low uh, net energy. So this is the way you can think about voltage and, uh, and amperage. So in the same way with our scanner, we can have uh, 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 we can control independently the voltage and the amperage. The amperage uh, gives you a sense about how many x-rays are coming out or how many photons you have available for imaging. The KV has to do with the energy of those x-rays. So obviously, if you're trying to image the temporal bone, you can't go too far down in terms of KV because you may not get enough uh, energy in the x-rays to go through the object. So now, where does that bring us to? That brings us to multi-detector scanners. So now we can scan the entire brain in anywhere from one to six seconds. One second would obviously be these scanners with a very wide detectors array. And this speed has to be considered uh, when we're imaging soft tissue because uh, you can finish the scan before there's time for the contrast to get into the soft tissues. So in a sense, we work against ourselves in some, issue, in some situation. For example, in CTA, in patients who have a high-grade carotid stenosis, uh, you may encounter cases where you're through the scan before the contrast has arrived in the image volume. But this has allowed CTA to be acquired, when, when it's done well, to be very close to catheter DSA angiography. And it allows us to do reformats that are equivalent to best to, uh, to uh, the source images. Coming back to this idea of dose, uh, because all detectors receive the same exposure and this wasted penumbra, oftentimes single slice scanners have a lower dose. Now, how do we measure dose? It's a little complicated, but I will, I will just bring to your attention this term. Uh, it's called CTDI volume. In the US, uh, pretty much all the scans have to display the, the C, uh, CTDI volume or the DLP. Uh, our scanners, will, will, we usually look at both. You should be familiar with these terms. This has become a standard means of expressing absorbed dose. And it's also a very good number for you to look at when you're trying to change parameters in a scan or compare different scanners uh, in, in order to understand how much dose is being given to the patient. Now, this is not a measured value. There's not a detector in the scanner that registers the actual dose. It's a calculated value. But it's a pretty good unit, and it's one that uh, you can use a diff across different platforms. The DLP is reflection of the dose, which is we get from the CTI volume, and the coverage. So the DLP is going to be larger for, let's say, a CTA that covers the head and neck than is going to be for a head scan. So the CT dose, this effective dose, is calculated by using a multiplier that's specific. So for a scan of the brain with a DLP of 1,000, which is pretty standard for a head CT scan, uh, uh, this has a lower effective dose than the same scan of the neck. And this has to do with the tissue radiated. So again, the, the, uh, uh, the effective dose is a calculation based on the applied uh, radiation, but it will vary for the body part. Gantry triangulation is something I want to, we talked about, touched on in another talk, but remember that on, uh, on most CT uh, scans that you look at, uh, they're angled in a way at a traditional angle, but they're usually acquired uh, in the same way that MR is acquired. And this has to do with uh, the fact that these large array scanners 
they can't be angled. And so we tend to acquire straight across the patient, and, but they, we tend to display them with this technique of elect, uh, what's called electric angulation. So again, reconstructions are made possible because of these isotropic voxels we touched on earlier in the talk. So when you see scans like this, where it looks like uh, there's a hematoma here that may be in the brain itself. When you look at the coronal reconstruction of the same data, you can see pretty clearly that this hemorrhage is actually along the tentorial leaf. So by viewing the brain in two views or the body in two views, uh, you get a much better appreciation for where substances lie uh, with relation to uh, normal anatomic structures. So I'm a big fan of reconstructions. I think early on, uh, there was some resistance to, uh, to putting all these reconstructions on packs because it made the number of scans that were acquired were quite substantial. Uh, but I think that the contribution to imaging uh, uh, accuracy of diagnosis far outweighs uh, any disadvantage to displaying them. Uh, here's another example here. You can see this area of low attenuation in the midline. You know, in a sense, so what does this represent? But when you look at the sagittal reconstruction, and you can see this is, of course, subcutaneous fat looks black here, air looks black. That has to do with the way we window the image. But here you can see pretty clearly this is a pericolosal lipoma. So it's easier to understand a lot of anatomic features when you display them in one of the uh, multiple projections. And the ability to uh, acquire any uh, plane of acquisition, which you can do when you reconstruct the data on a 3D workstation, I, re I really think has contributed both to our understanding of anatomy and uh, diagnostic potential. This is a merging slice data. So this is the way we tend to look at images. This is a five millimeter slice through the brain. And you can see maybe something there, maybe nothing there. But when we look at the same data at 1.25, okay, so here's what, now you can sort of see it. You know, there's this saying, I'll, I'll see it when I believe it. You see this area of low attenuation that courses through here? This is what it looks like on the source data. This is what it looks like on the reconstructed data. This is a, a calibration error in the scanner. So this is an artifact that is being projected on this image that might be mistaken for a lacunar infarct in this pot eight head. So, um, so the, remember that you're losing information by merging the displaced data, but, uh, but at the same time, look at the noise on this image compared to the noise on this image. So there's some benefits to it. Well, I think uh, I'm gonna end on that note. Uh, I think uh, I just want to review, in a sense, what I've tried to explain to you is some of the terminology of CT imaging, some of the parameters that you can uh, interact with to alter patients. Specifically, these are pitch. You want to go up in pitch to decrease dose. You're going to go down in pitch if you want to increase resolution that you might need for, say, uh, CTA or temporal bone studies. You can modify KVP. There's a move towards lower KVP, which substantially reduces dose, uh, while at the same time, uh, you can uh, uh, alter MA if you want to increase, in a sense, the quality of the imaging and decrease the noise. So uh, I'll take any questions you have about that information I covered. Uh, I know it's familiar to some of you and maybe not so familiar to others but I wanna put everyone on good footing before we get into this uh, in uh, the next session. Uh, I also wanna uh, just bring to your attention that next Tuesday, we have another invited speaker. It's uh, Dr. Lori Lovner. She's the Chief of Neuroradiology at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, really a world-renowned head and neck expert. And she's gonna be talking about uh, skull-based lesions involving the cella and paracellar region. So I'll send you a link uh, for that lecture. I urge you to attend that and maybe recommend it to your friends, particularly uh, people that are interested in head and neck imaging. So again, next Tuesday at 9.30. Happy to take any questions from anyone at this time. No questions?
Well, thank you very much for attending Quarantine University today and stay well and uh, appreciate you uh, uh, attending this and uh, providing encouragement for uh, all of us uh, to continue to learn. Thank you, Dr.